Tuesday, sorry. Um, I'm Gareth, so I just wanted to check, was anyone in my session last year at this event? Or are you new faces? Okay, cool. Uh, Okay, so just quickly, who am I? I uh, work at a company called My Valley, uh, which is a learning experience technology company. If any of you are developers, especially in Ruby, we are hiring, so check it out. Uh, I used to be a penetration tester, uh, which means basically I was a hacker for hire. So I used to do primary assessment penetration tests for telcos, banks, all over Asia and the Middle East. Uh, so that was where I got real kind of commercial experience in security. Uh, and also, I still write about security every week. I have a top five infosec blog for Darknet. So, Darknet was somehow interested in information security. This is from way back. I started this in 1999. Uh, was anyone here born after 1999? Okay, that's pretty close. So, we have someone from 1997. So, yeah, I, I started it a long time ago. Uh, coincidentally, the co founder was actually from Penang. Uh, he lived in Julia Street. Uh, we started it on IRC, on FNET. Did anyone use IRC? Okay, oh, yeah. we have a few slightly older people. Uh, the blog started in 2006. I uh, had about 40,000 RSS subscribers, a lot of awards and all that stuff. If you want to keep up with some InfoSec stuff, you can subscribe to Darknet. Uh, it's quite a cool blog. I had a forum as well. Uh, when I started doing security in Korea, I got very interested in it. Uh, we used to use Usenet, which was a horrible place. So I started a forum instead on PHP I uh, sold it in 2004, but it was pretty popular. Microsoft used to put write about it in their newsletters. Uh, so that was, that's kind of my history of InfoSec. Uh, this talk, I'm going to cover the principles of information security. So kind of define it and explain in a broad sense what you need to know. Uh, basic do's and don'ts. It's framed for web application development, but the principles apply to everything. If you're doing embedded devices, you're doing mobile apps, you're doing web apps, you're doing hardware, it's, it's the same kind of principles. Uh, and then I'm going to run through the first five of the OS top ten, uh, which is a, a list of the most, both most frequent and most dangerous uh, web application vulnerabilities. So, uh, just to get a check of, of the audience, is there anyone here ran a site or an app that's been hacked before? Yeah, two, three, four, five, okay. Anyone that's run anything, I've been hacked before, and I'm a hacker, so, you know, it's nothing to be embarrassed about. Sometimes you forget to update, you use a shitty password, someone wrote a plugin that is cracked and it got hacked. Uh, it happens. Um, has anyone here who's worked in InfoSec? Like professionally? Okay, we got one. Uh, and anyone who knows what the OS top 10 is? I hope you do. <laughs> what? Okay, okay, that's good. You all should learn something today. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start out really basic, just with an introduction. Um, so, we've defined what is information security. So, information security is defined by this triad, triad of CIA. So, does anyone, if you absolutely 100% know this, please don't answer. But if you like, if you think you have an idea and you want to have a guess, does anyone, even if you just think you know one of the letters, does anyone want to guess what ECIA stands for? No? Very quiet audience. Okay. So basically, this is how you define information security. The CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These are the three things that you need all the time to say that you have a secure data set or a secure piece of information or a secure app. Confidentiality is but it's somehow got compressed. Um, but it's basically keeping the data secret. Integrity is keeping the data unchanged, and availability is keeping the data accessible. So, to have security data or information security, you need all three of these at the same time, all the time, basically. So, 
to expand on these a little bit. Um, in terms of web access, and, and, and in general, this is preventing an unauthorized disclosure of information. So if you, any, any of you read the news, you would have seen Yahoo got hacked a couple of years back in 2014, and all the records just got exposed. So this is a confidentiality leak. Um, up to 500 million accounts, hash passwords, secret questions in plain text were leaked. Um, so this is a, a breach of confidentiality. This is user information that as a Yahoo user you would not have expected this to be on the public internet. Um, this obviously can lead to legal issues from users or companies. And the scary part about this is a hacker only needs to read access to your system to cause this kind of damage. So it's a uh, they don't need very heavy access rights to be able to leak. And you see this happen a lot. Every two or three months, a major company database will get leaked. Sometimes the passwords are encrypted, sometimes they're not, sometimes it's credit card details. Um, so it can get very, very serious. The second of CIA is integrity. So this is guarding against improper information modification or destruction. So that means changing records or deleting them. Either of those. Basically, compromise, compromise your data set integrity. Um, this is less frequent, but much more damaging if you allow this to happen. This is actually a, a screenshot of a Malaysian website, uh, one of the universities, I think. So, a lot of this happens for the ones that are visible happen for political reasons. So, they'll say, you know, treat our workers better or you know, stop burning the forest or whatever. Um, the ones that you don't see are the scary ones. There's a lot of these hacks that are deep into your websites, our websites, government websites that no one knows about. They're in there, they're deleting stuff, they're changing stuff, and unless you have the systems in place, you would never know. Like, there's something called APT, which is Advanced Persistent Threat. So these are the ones that the governments talk about, that they get in, and they stay there for years. And no one even knows that they're there. So, I'll talk more about how to prevent that later, but these, if the hacker, they do need right access to pull this off, like either to your web server files, to your database somewhere in your system, they need right access to change stuff. So that's the one that you have to be most careful with, is right access. And the third one uh, is the toughest one to deal with. This is availability. So this is ensuring timely and reliable access to the information. So that's if you have information and no one can access it, it's useless, like basically. So if your website is great and you think it's amazing, but it's down, it, it sucks, like it's useless. Like no one can access it, 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 it becomes irrelevant. So I don't know if anyone saw in the news, but just last week we had a record breaking DDoS. It was 620 gigabits per second. So there's this is a security blogger who's been exposing or these rings that run DOS attacks for money, uh, and they started attacking him. So he was protected uh, by Akamai, which is one of the largest. Is anyone familiar with Akamai? It's quite a common name in the web. Yeah, it's, it's one of the largest content distribution networks, and they had to pull out. Like they couldn't deal with the amount of bandwidth these guys were generating. Um, so these can be super damaging. If they can keep up a DDoS against you longer or, or bigger than you can, you can get a bandwidth for, your site will just stay down indefinitely. Um, it's very hard to prevent, very hard to protect against, and the hacker needs no access. They just need to know your domain or your IP address or your DNS server IP address, and it can take you offline. So this is the one way you don't want to piss off the wrong people, because some people this for fun. Like, they'll say, hey, you said I don't know anything, I'm just going to take your site down. And like, Paul Brian, he's been having it for weeks and weeks and weeks and it's really hard to deal with. So, this is the third one, availability. So I just run through some of the web app do's and don'ts, but like I said before, these kind of apply to everything, uh, whatever, whatever technology you're developing on. So the first rule of everything is never trust user input. Never, ever, ever, ever. 
you don't know who the user is, what their intent is, or if they just made a genuine mistake, or it's a malicious user. So I don't know if you, any of you have seen this comment before by me, some of this uh, XKCD. So the story here is the school calls the parent. So you say, hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. The, the mother says, oh dear, did you break something? The school says, in a way. Then the school asks, did you really name your son Robert, apostrophe, bracket, semicolon, drop table students, semicolon, dash, dash. <laughs> oh yes, we call it little, little Bobby Tables. So basically, if you understand any SQL, what's happening here is an SQL injection. Page STS. 
So if you're a web guy, it's important to turn this on. Basically what this means is, if a user requests your site over HTTP, it will put a cookie on the browser that tells them to use HTTPS instead. So it's a way you can kind of help your user to enforce HTTPS usage. It's a super easy thing if you're using Apache or Nginx, just Google at Nginx HSTS and it will tell you how to turn it on. It's a, it's a very simple thing to do. Um, that's one. The second, like, if you can, just redirect everything. Redirect all, uh, this is what I tend to do. Just redirect all HTTP requests to HTTPS. That means no one can make a plain text request to your web app at all or your API. Um, again, if you're using Nginx or Apache, this is super easy to do. Um, you, can, you can Google it, it's just like one or two lines you can put in your, your virtual post file. Um, and, and follow the same standards at the back end as well. So, say you've abstracted your application code from your server, like your Nginx and your PHP is running separately, try and make sure the transits are encrypted. Always make sure your app to your database is encrypted. That's the most important one. So obviously the database is usually where the really important stuff is. Um, so you don't want to be sent, even if you, you think, oh, I'm using you know, private IP addresses, it's pretty safe. If someone else is in that data center, they can get access to that stuff. So always assume around you is minimal security and do whatever you can to maximize your own security. So this is another one, um, which in Malaysia, I've seen this not followed very often. There's a lot of websites I can retrieve my password, which should be impossible. You should never, ever be able to retrieve your password. Your password should be irretrievable. Like whatever you're doing is in a phone app or a web app, like never ever store a password anywhere in plain text. It's after the first one, injections, this is probably the worst thing you could do. Um, so this is a, a, a dump file, which was from a dating site. I think plenty of fish. It was about 200 million records, and all the passwords were in plain text. So, they're in plain text, and that's dangerous enough, but the scary thing is that the majority of people use the same password for everything. So once you've got this, you've got an email address and a password. And then you can go to Facebook, Google, their bank, reset their password, take over their account. So many people have got their identity stolen just because this developer was lazy and didn't catch his password. That is, that's all it takes. That you just, oh, no one's gonna get into my databases. You know, I watched Gareth's talk, that shit's good. No, you're gonna get hacked, they're gonna get your database so protected. Assume, always, in security terms, you always wanna assume the worst is gonna happen because at some point it, it might. Um, so just hash, hash all your passwords. Is there anyone here who doesn't know what hashing is? That is fine if you don't, I can explain it. So everyone, if I ask you, you can explain what hashing is. Okay. I'm going to explain it because I don't believe you, all of you. Um, so hashing is a cryptographic function which is intended to be one way. So most cryptography is symmetric. That means you encrypt something and you have a key and you can decrypt it. But with hashing, you can't decrypt it. What you're doing is encrypting something and then just storing the hash. So what happens when you log into Maybank or CIMB or whatever, is they take your password, they hash it, and then they compare the hash to the one in the database. They don't take your password and compare it to your password because once you create your password, it's gone. Like, once it's hashed, uh, it's stored in the database and the hash. So you can reverse hashes, technically it's not decrypting it, but you can brute force it. So what it means is you take millions of words and you hash them and then you compare the hashes. So there's various ways to do that faster called rainbow tables. Um, so hashes are not the ultimate level of security as well, but they make it a lot harder for a malicious actor to get access to the passwords. Um, another thing you can do which makes it a lot harder to crack it, that if you don't crack it with rainbow tables, it's fairly straightforward to reverse the hash. It, if you have like Amazon now, they have the GPU instances. If you load up a GPU instance, probably in less than 10 minutes, you could crack everyone's password without source. 
it's, it's very easy. Um, so what a salt is, is basically it's just another string that whatever library or algorithm you're using appends to the end of the hash. So every user has a different salt. So that means the salt is fine, but you can let the attacker know the salt. But it means they have to change their calculation for every single user. So it slows them down exponentially. Um, so always make sure that one, you hashed it, two, you've salted the hash, and then three, make sure you're using a good algorithm. So what we recommend now is bcrypt or scrypt. Most, if you're using Laravel or Rails or whatever, they also support bcrypt. So you can just, if, you, if you're maintaining a system that's a few years old, you might just want to check this and, and make sure it's, you've switched it to bcrypt because these two can be prepped super fast now. They have a problem, a uh, cryptographic problem called collisions. So a collision is when two hashes are the same. So you can calculate people's hashes a lot faster. Um, it's fairly straightforward to convert. Uh, so just make sure you're using a, a, a good encryption. And always use a validated library. So this is another one that I tell you. Uh, don't ever, ever try and implement cryptographic functions yourself. Like, just don't do it. This is the biggest flaw in all cryptography is people trying to implement it themselves. Like, a lot of the attacks and, and hacks that you see where the clickbait headline is about the cryptographic function, it's not. It's actually about the implementation. So the majority of the time there's a flaw in the implementation, not in the algorithm itself. So again, if you're using a framework, this is done and it's validated. Like, so just leverage like, that function. Um, if you're building something from scratch, you can still download a library to do this for you. Like, if you're using, P just Google like PHP bcrypt or Ruby bcrypt or C bcrypt. There will be a library vetted by industry experts that say this, this is implemented properly, there's no problems with it. You can use it. So this part is super important as well. Like actually, when it comes to passwords, all of these are super important. This is one of the one area where you know just one mistake, say you you fail to validate something properly on the web front end, where you could just expose user passwords. It's so much harder for anyone to do anything if you just follow these commands. Is correct. 
what does he have access to? So this is where you have like active admin in Ruby that controls access levels to the backend. Um, this is the pilot system, which also a lot of people do really badly. Like this is the part that I've seen implemented mm, terribly the most times because they think they built. I've got an authorization system and an admin. And a lot of times, all it takes is you just change the parameters in the URL and you can access anything. So they're not actually continuously validating per request. They just say, oh, you're in this area of the site, means you can access everything. So, and access control. So that means different users, usually they're grouped in levels, say like WordPress. You have a user, publisher, editor. So that would be the authorization system. So when you log in, it would say, okay, UID one, which level, and typically it, it, it fans up. So if you're, a, if you're an editor, you're also a user. If you're an admin, you're also an editor and a user. So typically that's how access control systems work. Um, and it will check when you log in. Again, like, it's repetitive, but use an existing framework to handle this whenever you can. Uh, again, the same stuff you're using, you know, Django, Laravel, uh, Rails, they all have this kind of stuff built in. Like, it's not pretty and it's not fancy, but it's validated and it's secure and it works. Um, especially a lot of developers for mobile apps are going this route nowadays, single sign-on. Um, that means using another Basically, they've done the first two parts for you. So if you use Facebook, Twitter, Google login, they've done the identity, they've validated the email address, and they've authenticated it. So that's all done for you. Like, you don't have to worry about that. Um, you just need to do the authorization part. So you have to link that Facebook ID to your user ID and allow them whatever access. Again, the SSO stuff is done in a lot of frameworks. Um, and you know, Facebook provides libraries for this SDKs, Twitter provides it, so you can uh, implement this fairly easily. Um, what I recommend for admin, super users, important stuff, try and use 2FA, two-factor. So two-factor is commonly in Malaysia, it's still SMS, which is not super secure, because SMS can be spoofed, phone numbers can be spoofed. Um, better is like, if what I use is the Google Authenticator app. So if you're using GitHub, um, I think Hotmail, Gmail, they all support Google Authenticator app. So what you do, just go in your options, find it. And it's good to get familiar with this as a user before you implement it as a developer. Because it can be quite, it can cause quite a lot of friction for a user if you do this wrongly. Uh, it can become very annoying. but. Um, it's, it's a really good protection. Once you have proper two-factor auth implemented, it's really hard for someone who is not that identity to log in as that identity. Because if it's just an email address and a password, that's quite easy to steal, to fish, to get them to enter it into a web form, to crack the hash. But if you log in and then it asks you for, oh, what's your one-time code? Or I've sent you an email, click the link, or I've sent you an SMS, what's the five digits? So those are things you can do. Um, and then re-authenticate for important actions. So GitHub and Gmail do that. Gmail doesn't do it in a normal UI, but if you log into the Google Apps admin panel and you want to change something, you have to re-enter your password. Same for GitHub, like if you want to delete a repo, um, you want to add a user, anything that could compromise the security of the organization, it'll ask you to re-enter. And GitHub supports two factor off as well. So obviously that makes it a step more secure. Um, this is a really simple one to do. You just have to change the copy on an error message. Um, hide the user existence. So like say if I was testing a system, one of the most beautiful things I, I could see is when I type in some gibberish and that system says that user does not exist. Because then I know I can brute force the system, and as soon as I get a user that exists, it's going to tell me a different error. And then I can brute force the password, because I know that user exists. So what you want to do here is just say user or username or password incorrect. Don't give away anything. Make sure you have a password. 
story of your message is to pervade. It just tells the user to do something wrong. But it doesn't tell the attacker the password is wrong or the user exists or doesn't exist. Like, this is super simple. It's just the text that you write on your error message. But it helps protect against brute forcing. Um, so those are the basics of the, the high level kind of do's and don'ts. Now we're going to take a look at the OS top 10. So the first one is kind of like the first one that we covered. Um, is A1 is injection. So this is the most common and the most dangerous type of web vulnerability. Uh, it also is less common on mobile because mobile is kind of ab abstracted from a database because it usually communicates through an API. Uh, so this is most commonly found in in uh, web. So you can see like scenario one, this could be in, in any language. Like it looks like PHP, but like, it's kind of pseudo language. So basically what you have here is a, a, a wrapped SQL query. So let's start from accounts by customer ID equals request parameter get parameter ID. So that means it's a form submission, get parameter ID that the user is, is putting in there. And it's running it straight into the interpreter. Like it's not stripping it, it's not sanitizing it. Uh, so if I put in their ID, like again an apostrophe, and then I broke out into another query, this would execute whatever I put in there. So when you're doing this as an attack, typically what you do is you just keep messing around until you get a visible error message. When you get an error message, you know that the function is not sanitizing the user input. Because you shouldn't be able, when I say error message, I mean database error message, not uh, language like PHP, not a front end error, but a database error. So when you see that, you know that app is probably vulnerable to SQL injection. Um, and then you just start, because when you start, you don't know what database is at the back. It could be MySQL, it could be PostgreSQL, it could be MSSQL, and they all have slightly different syntax. Um, thankfully, nowadays we have tools that can automate the SQL injection scanning. So it will look for specific patterns or error messages, and then it will identify which storage engine it uses, and then it will start pumping up all the SQL injections for that data store. So it's a lot faster to do this now. Once I get an error message, I'll just run the scanner, and, and it will start doing unions, joins, it will use common table names. A lot of the error messages actually show the table names in the error as well, the database name, the table name, depending on how you build your query, because a lot of people use the format uh, table name dot, uh, database name dot table name. So when that shows in the error, if I know what your database name is, I know what your table name is, I know what your field names are, then I can start to build more and more, and then I'll start to shift to other tables, trying to pull out credit card details and all that kind of stuff. So this is the one that you've got to be super, super, super careful about. Um, same thing, even if it's like slightly abstracted, it can still be vulnerable. And this is as simple as this. Like uh, in this case, it's not a form; it's a, a URL parameter. So it's as simple as this. So what happens here is. You have a select statement, so it's select star from accounts where customer ID equals whatever, or one equals one. So one definitely equals one. So what that does is it dumps every single record in the database, because one equals one is true. And it's basically running that at the end of this query. So this is the least damaging kind of SQL injection and the most basic one, but if this runs, it basically dumps the whole table. Every, because it's using star as well, not a column name, or specific column names, it dumps every column, every record. So this is like a jackpot when you're hacking someone and you do all one is one and it's just like everything. Um, and it's especially dangerous when it's like this in a URL parameter. Because it's super easy to manipulate. And this is how most of the SQL injection scanners work on manipulating the URL parameters. And they just keep pumping in. 
or one equals one, okay, that works, or one equals one, join, uh, use the table, join, union, something else, and they'll keep going, keep going until you can basically expose the whole database through one, one bad implementation of one query. So yeah, never, never trust user input. User input includes whatever you can type in the URL bar, uh, not limited to form submissions. <coughs> You can see that here, basically what you're doing is you're escaping the query with an apostrophe and then you're running an append to that. So there's all kind of different ways to do this, you can, you can look it up. Um, there'll be different syntax for your language and for your data store. So if you just get familiar with these, it'll kind of give you the mindset of slightly better how to protect against them. Um, the most critical thing you need to do is separate the interpreter from the command or the query. So that means whatever comes in on the URL or in a form, you never send it directly to the interpreter. Like you always have to abstract it in some way. Uh, for SPR, it's means binding calls in prepared statements, which is one way. Uh, the most common way is using some kind of API. So uh, like in Ruby, we have Active Record. So that's basically an API for all the data stores which abstracts the queries away from the interpreter. So active record is talking to the database and these queries are talking to active record. There's a layer in between. So every language has this. Um, PHP used to be like the ODCB connectors. Now it has like a MySQL I object. It has full APIs for every database now. So you, you, you can completely Never do queries directly to the database from the language, basically. Like it's easy and you can debug it really fast, but it's really, really, really dangerous. Like, really dangerous. Um, the good thing is, is the patterns that cause these problems are fairly well known. So you can use static analysis tools and they can scan this and they can find these problems. So. What we use at MyBelly is a web tool called Code Climate. So Code Climate is a whole bunch of different static analysis tools. They support PHP, uh, Ruby, Python, I think. And they look for stuff like this, like security vulnerabilities, along with other stuff like code duplication, overly complex methods. Um, like, but the tool it's based on for Ruby is called BreakMap. So you can just look, um, Google like static analysis tool for your language. There's, there's scanners for PHP, Python, Ruby, C, C++. Um, mobile languages, I'm not so sure. Just like I said, generally mobile languages don't have any direct access to the interpreter anyway. They may be the local database, but whatever data store is going through an API, it might be Firebase or Amazon API gateway, but it's very rarely a, a mobile app will have direct access to the database. Um, but yeah, like just Google static analysis for your language, download it, run it through your code base. Um, if you're working on open source projects, most of them are free. Like code time is free. If your GitHub repo is open, um, it's free to scan it. So just plug it in, scan it, it'll come up with all the problems. <coughs> This is similar to the one I mentioned earlier, but uh, in a bit more depth. So this is when I said, make sure you author, like, authenticate users safely. Um, this is a combination of like hashing your password and really understanding how the authentication, the authorization, and the sessions work together, um, and not exposing stuff. So like, in this. Scenario is an airline reservation application that supports URL rewriting. So it puts the session ID as a URL parameter. So an authenticated user of the site wants to let his friends know what he's booking. So he sends the link without knowing he's giving away his session ID. So what that means is um, 
As soon as that guy clicks the link, you'll be logged in as his friend. It won't ask him to log in again because the session ID is in the URL. So, and this is not a far-fetched. People think, oh, that's silly. No one would do that. I see if you if you Google my blog and the star, this happened to me many years ago. Um, a journalist from the star sent me a link to something, and it also had a link to their email at the bottom. So I clicked the email, the session ID was in the URL, I got logged into the star journalist inbox. So I sent some emails, took some screenshots, sent it back to them and said, dude, I think your email system is kind of shit. Now you might want to have a look at that. So this, especially if you're using older, older systems, you can test this just by opening an incognito browser, pasting the URL across. If you're still logged in, then it sucks. If you're logged out and it asks you to log in again, then it's authenticating properly. Um, so just be aware of this. So sometimes, this one is very common as well, application timeouts aren't set properly. So if you use a public computer and you don't click the logout button, sometimes the session times are really long. So this is where Facebook checking happens. That you go to a public computer and someone's still logged into Facebook, of course you're going to write a stupid message on the wall. That is, this is what you do, right? So, um, the general rule for this is like, the more important it is, the more often you want to log the user out. So, for banking, like you'll see, you'll have that pop up, you've been inactive for five minutes, we're going to log you out. Because banking is probably, in web terms, the most important. Like for your Gmail, the session time is really long. Basically, it doesn't log out unless... If you say, normally when you log in, it'll have that little box that says, do you trust this computer? So you use that when... If you don't use that, the session time will be like an hour or two hours, then it'll log you out. If you say, I trust this computer, the session time is basically indefinite. So depending on your app and the kind of data that you're storing, you might want to consider what kind of logout time you want to put. Um, typically for me, like reporting systems and stuff, I put 24 hours. For stuff that doesn't have any, you can't make any changes, I'll put really long sessions because users get annoyed, especially my CEO, with logging in all the time. Um, but yeah, just be aware of this. Don't, don't, security is always a balance between security and convenience. So the more convenient something is, the less secure it will be. The more secure it is, the less convenient it will be. So you have to have a balance and be very aware of how important what you're protecting is. So is it super critical? Is it financial data? Is it social security numbers, passport scans? Then yeah, make the logout like 15 minutes. Then make it super short. Is it a read-only system for watching videos or something which the user can't really do any damage to? Yeah, then make the sessions really long. Make it as convenient as possible. Um, Again, as we said earlier, never ever stop playing text passwords. Like, even on your day-to-day -day life, don't store them in Notepad or in, the, in Spotlight or whatever. Use a password manager, generate proper passwords. Educate your users on how to generate proper passwords. Educate your users to use a password manager, to not write your password on a post-it note and put it on a monitor. Um, password. Security is kind of like the hygiene of information security. So it's like you can be lazy and smelly and like just write it somewhere. Or you can have good hygiene, you can change your passwords every three months. You can, if you use a password manager, it makes that super easy. You can generate strong passwords, you can have a unique password for every website. That's the recommended minimum that everyone does. So if you're doing that as a developer, you also want to try and push your users to follow those standards because it will make them more secure um, and less likely to compromise your site in as a byproduct. Um, as per this, don't expose session IDs, like hide them, put them in a cookie, encrypt them, you know, do what I mean you can to protect them because it's quite a, a, a valuable resource. If I can check your session ID, I can basically log in as you. Um, there's a tool you can look up for this, it's called Black Sheep. So basically you can go to Starbucks, connect to the Wi-Fi, run Black Sheep, and then log in as anyone on Facebook or Gmail that's using that network, not on HTTPS. They have to not be using, if they're using, like I said earlier, they're using an encrypted transport, you 
can't get their session ID. But if they're using HTTP, basically the session ID is not in the URL, but it's still in the headers in the packets that go through the network. So but you can get anyone to come um, if you can get their session ID. So as there is above as well, make sure sessions time out appropriately, obviously according to whatever you're protecting. And don't reuse session IDs too much, like too quickly. Um, try and make them quite long if you can, so they don't collide and you get users impersonating each other. Um, and don't send, this should say unencrypted, don't send passwords or sessions over unencrypted transport. That's what I was talking about uh, earlier. So you can look up Black Sheep, it's a really fun tool. You can do it in your office as well and steal everyone's Facebook account. Um, but yeah, don't, basically, sessions and passwords are virtually equivalent. If you have either one of them, you can log in as that person. Obviously, until the session expires. Once that session expires, you can't use it anymore. But as long as that session is active, um, you can log in as that person. So don't ever send these over plain HTTP transport. Is it anyone in that network, like uh, Starbucks and all those kind of network? If you're using Wi-Fi, it's basically a round robin network. So everyone can hear everything. It's not a switch network. Like your connection to the router is not secure. Like everyone's using the same frequency. Once you're connected, everyone can sniff everyone else's traffic. So just as a user, be aware of that as well. I think Facebook's already enforced HTTPS. So whenever you log in, it's 100% on HTTPS. But just as a user, like if a site has a HTTPS option, use that. They always use that. So this is uh, A3. Um, potentially this might be the most common attack, and in many cases it's not super damaging, but it can be really annoying and it can be really damaging. Uh, what it stands for, XSS, is cross-site scripting. You might have seen this. A lot of people have kind of seen it, but they don't really understand what it means. So the example here is an application uses untrusted data in the construction of a HTML snippet without validation or escaping. So in a way, it's kind of similar to the first one, injection, uh, but this is not using the database interpreter. This, this is using the browser as an interpreter. So typically, this one is always in JavaScript. What you're doing is you're uh, injecting JavaScript into the page and then running it as the browser. So a lot of times this can be embedded in a search parameter and when you run that search parameter you'll get a pop-up or you'll see some stuff on the page. It's not always uh, permanent damage to the site. So you can see in this example, uh, you can see string page, then uh, this is a form, uh, input name, credit card, text, value, equals, and then the parameter that was injected. So what the attacker does is they modify the CC parameter in their browser because it might be either in a form or in the query string to put this in. So this is the most common kind of XSS. It's an apostrophe and then a close bracket. So what that does, that closes out the query here instead of there. And then it inserts another script stanza with, and this is a lot of XSS is exactly like this as well. So it'll grab your cookie, document.cookie, and then it will submit it to some kind of form. So back to the previous slide, basically what this has done is got your session. It's your cookie has everything, your username, your session ID, how long you've been logged in, what the website is, trusted domain, all that stuff. So if the site is vulnerable to cross-site scripting, and they run this, you as a user click on this link, and execute this, your session ID will be sent to the attacker. So this is uh, quite a common one. It's not super damaging, say I'm a website owner or application vendor, it's not super damaging to me, but it can commonly be damaging to the user of the platform. 
So it can enable phishing attacks. We'll typically try stuff like this to automate grabbing sessions. And some sites still put passwords and stuff in, in the cookies. So they'll just grab your cookie and they'll see what, other, what, what kind of goodies they got inside. Again, repetitive, but it's super important because it comes from the same place. Never ever trust user input. Um, like I said, these attacks focus on a browser as an interpreter. So these are not going after your data store. They're not hitting your backend of the form. It should be escaped or sanitized. So when they inject it into that, where it says CC, into the get parameter request, this should just be plain text. Uh, that's the, the best way to do it. This is not such a well supported area as SQL injection. Like SQL injection has loads of libraries. Um, this one, not so much. But there are libraries out there that can help you with this. Uh, again, you can do some backend validation if possible. But usually, by the time this hits the backend,